Well, what a wonderful spring day it is, and how right that seems for Easter. That freshness, that newness, that new life. We've been enjoying it for a number of days now, seeing the hedges bursting. Seems almost that it happens within three days. Suddenly the hawthorn is bare, suddenly it's green. And the blackthorn brightening up the hedges. We've had snowdrops long ago now, but the daffodils are still around. The birds are singing, making and made their nests. When we came for the dawn service this morning, there was a great spotted woodpecker drumming just over in the trees there, another sign of spring. All these signs of new life all around us. How fortunate we are in this country to celebrate Easter at this time with all these natural reminders of something which is at the heart of our faith. But of course, we see them each year. Leaves fall. Leaves grow again. Summer visitor birds fly away and come back. A cycle renewed each year. We celebrate something which is new every year and all through the year. The resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ once and for all. In one place, but for all place and all time. As the Roman centurion in the play said to Pilate's wife, where is he? Let loose in the world, lady, where neither Roman nor Jew can stop his truth. And that is what we come to celebrate today. That pattern of new life after darkness, after what has been drear and dull, in a way it's similar to the pattern in our own lives, not just the spring of childhood and the winter, no, it's not quite, is it, but a bit wintry sometimes, of old age. And also those periods of deadness and pain. And then times of new vigor and contentment. We experience them all, each one of us. It's there in the church's year. The birth of Jesus at the dead of winter. The long, bleak season of Lent. The new life bursting from the tomb at Easter. It's often not easy to find an Easter card with a picture of the risen Christ on it. There are plenty of hens and chickens and bunnies and even teddy bears and rabbits. And in a way, chickens from eggs and flowers from earth are a tiny part of Easter, but only a tiny part of Easter. Because we're not here to celebrate spring, however wonderful it is and however grateful we are that it's come round again. We're here to celebrate the risen Christ. But as we look at nature, we may think of something that has made it possible. Not just the Creator God, a bit younger than the Creator God, though his handiwork, and I mean the sun, the sun which is literally life-giving. Even on the darkest, coldest day, the sun is actually a powerhouse, making life possible and making us able to see. The book of Revelation speaks of the risen Christ with his face like the sun, 
shining at full strength. We sometimes sing the hymn, Christ whose glory fills the sky. Or we used to sing in the evening, Son of my soul, thou Savior dear. It was on a Sunday that the Lord rose from the dead. Two days after Good Friday. Not just two events in the life of Jesus, but happenings which point to the nature of God and can transfigure our lives and that of the whole world. C.S. Lewis once wrote, I believe in the resurrection of Christ as I believe that the Son has risen. Not because I can look on it direct, but because by it I see everything else. For the first Christians, all was changed by Easter. Like the sun, the risen Christ becomes a means of seeing all that truly is. Everything becomes new. It's about new beginnings, not just in first century Palestine. It's true every single day. On days of depression, when we're down in the dumps and everything's gray, suffering illness or bereavement, the sun may be hidden, but it's still there, a life-giving force. So the Christ, for Christ is risen and is Lord of life, as was found on the wall of the cell of a Jewish prisoner. I believe in the sun, even when it is not shining. I believe in love, even when I cannot feel it. I believe in God, even when he is silent. Even in our worst days, God is on our side. We look to Jesus and we see how God is. In the cross, his love. The empty tomb, the garden of Easter morning. The disciples walking to Emmaus, knowing Gradually learning that life was stronger than death and they were convicted by it and preached it, whatever the risk was, including risk of their lives. For Christ has risen and we, like they, are an Easter people. We live in the light of that resurrection. We don't ignore the reality of evil and sin, of suffering and sickness and pandemics, which eat into our lives. We see the negative and the destructive things, but transformed by the cross. Because of Easter, We know that in the end, all will be well. And that we trust, too, for our loved ones who have gone before. We know that we're held by God through life and death. Easter Day makes it clear for all time how things truly are. And so... May the joy of Easter and the power of the risen Christ be yours today and throughout the whole of your life. Amen. It's interesting to compare how the Easter story is told in the New Testament with how it 
often comes in some of our hymns. The hymns, I suppose, expressing a doctrine on a number of occasions, talk almost with a violence, the crushing of death. For Judas' lion has burst his chains, crushing the serpent's head, one of the Easter hymns says, bursting from the spiced tomb. And yet, as you read the gospel stories, like that one we've just heard from John's gospel, is different. There's a quietness. There's a gentleness. There's a kind of reflectiveness about it. And that is so true to how faith often happens. The way that Jesus comes to the individual or to a small group, as on that first Easter day and in the weeks following, up to his ascension, coming quietly, coming often unexpectedly. And that is how it works and has worked for many people. They may know Christ within a group, within a church, perhaps. And yet, he comes to the individual. I remember some years ago when I had to assess a number of students to see if they were ready to go forward to the next stage of training for ordination. And I had an interesting conversation with Martin. And he told me of how he came to faith. He hadn't grown up in a church-going family. Christian belief had not been talked about in that family. It just didn't register. But Martin's great passion was walking hiking, rambling. And he was a police cadet. And one of his senior officers, who also was very much into hiking and rambling, said to Martin, look, I know you like rambling. Um, our church group is going, um, it's going to take us four days, three nights. We're going across the south of England, I think from Winchester. But anyway, they're ending up in Canterbury. Why don't you come with us? And Martin said, yeah, I'm not part of your group, though. I mean, I don't believe that. And he said, no, you like walking. Why don't you come? So Martin said, okay, I'll come. And so they went. And on the first night when they stopped and pitched camp, made their fire, they had a little communion service. And there were quite a number of them there. Martin was at the back. He wasn't taking, apparently, too much notice. The next night when they did this, Martin was sort of in the middle of the group. On the final night, he was at the front of the group. It had got him. The Eucharist had spoken to him. The Lord had stepped out, as it were, and confronted Martin and come into his life. He is, I believe, now a very faithful parish priest in the church. The way the Lord comes to an individual so often quietly. He came showing the signs in his hands, his feet, his side. That saying, this is the same Lord who was crucified now risen and living, the same one, showing that crucifixion and resurrection go together as part 
of one drama. And then coming to Thomas. Thomas wasn't there the first time in the room when Jesus came. Thomas, very down-to-earth Thomas, very sort of prosaic Thomas, perhaps a bit of a pessimist. Unless I can see, I'm not going to believe. And the Lord came. And Thomas converted and went all the whole way, my Lord and my God. But Thomas, who doubted. Don't let's forget the doubt. Wasn't it the poet Tennyson who said, there is more faith in honest doubt, believe me, than in half the creeds. Doubt can have a place in the life of faith. Living with questions. We can't know everything. We don't know just how it happened or how it happened. We don't know how or when God is going to speak. But work with the questions. Honest doubt. Not the doubt that just is determined not to believe, not to wrestle with the questions. But the one that will. There are those who just cut themselves off. I don't believe. I can't believe. And there it stays. Rather like a fellow student of mine, you think, who had a large notice on his study door which said, my mind's made up, don't confuse me with facts. But that works with doubt. I think of a lawyer who used to come to church from time to time, saying to me very wistfully, I wish I could believe. He was working with it working with those questions. And so perhaps that is something that Thomas can remind us of today. And for Thomas, the working with it led to that deep faith, my Lord and my God. And tradition says, and there's plenty of evidence for it, that Thomas went to India and preached there and almost founded the first church in India. Certainly there are churches in India where the Christians call themselves the Christians of St. Thomas. There are quite a few strange stories that have grown up around Thomas, but that is an indication of the impression that he made because he had found the risen Lord. Amen. You are witnesses of these things. Just six words in English, just three in the Greek of the New Testament. You are witnesses of these things. And because they were witnesses, in a real sense, we are here today. For the idea and the function of witnessing stands near the heart of faith. It is through witness one way or another by one person or another that we have come to Christian faith. There's a sense in which the whole of the Bible is based on witnessing. What is a witness? A witness is someone who said, I was there, I saw it, I heard it. I can testify to it. If you want the modern version, of course, it's been there, done that, got the T-shirt. 
That is the witness. Christian tradition knows of two kinds of witness. The word that is used for witness in the New Testament is the word martyr. We think of martyr in one particular way. Someone who has died, given their lives for what they believed. The church in her tradition has talked about red martyrs and white martyrs. The red, the one who gives their life, lays down their life for their faith, for their beliefs. The white martyr is the one who bears a witness by living, perhaps a long life. James and John, the two brothers who Jesus called his disciples. James, one of the very first to give his life for his faith, a red martyr. His brother John, living to great old age, one of the great white martyrs. There used to be, in ancient Rome, a sculpture of an ox. It was an ox with a head which looked two ways. Looking one way, it looked to an axe. Looking the other way, it looked to the yoke. And underneath the words, ready for either. A life witnessed by death, or a life witnessed by long and faithful life. We saw it in a sense in Uganda in the 1970s. One of the great archbishops of the African church was Jawani Lumum, and he was killed officially according to Idi Amin, who of course was the president of Uganda then, it was a car crash. It was generally reckoned and has been proved since that he was martyred in that car crash. It was done on the orders of President Idi Amin. And the members of his church, all of them came out onto the hill outside Kampala, the capital, to mourn their beloved archbishop. And the old retired archbishop, Erika Sabiti, came out and began to read the resurrection story. And when he came to the lines, Why seek ye the living among the dead? The people started to sing softly at first, glory, glory, alleluia, getting stronger and stronger, and ready in that to face whatever came from a means authorities. The red martyr and the white martyr, as it were, together in that action. So, we are called to be witnesses. There is a little verse in the first letter of St. Peter, which used to be quoted a lot when I was at a certain stage of being a student. Be ready always to give to anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. Yes, we are all called to be witnesses. But what was usually missed out were the few words that came after that. Be ready always to give a reason for the hope that is in you, but do it with gentleness and reverence. Not the witness which is with what's sometimes called vulgar evangelism, but the sensitive witness. 
which takes the other person seriously, doesn't trample over them, doesn't force anything on them. You can't commend the gospel by forcing it. But we are witnesses to these things. The great things of Christian faith aren't because of human thought or thinking or philosophizing or imagining. They're because of the mighty acts of God in Christ. And to those, we are called to be witness by our lives. Pray God, not by our death when it comes in a long time. It is perhaps the mark of a good teacher that the teacher can take something which is a common experience or something which is known to those to whom she or he is speaking, maybe referring to an action seen over and over again in daily life, or referring to something which people pass each day, or at least see from time to time throughout the year. Taking it and using it as a basis for some teaching. And because it's using something which is already known, it rings a bell, it strikes a chord, it stays in the mind, and when you see or experience that thing again, then it brings to mind the teaching. Jesus, of course, was the great teacher. And time and again, he pointed to things which were in everyday experience of those who heard him. And so it would be when he said, I am the vine. Now we must remember this is St. John's Gospel. And John's Gospel almost never is about what is just there in the surface meaning. There is that, but there is more underneath, and sometimes a symbolic meaning. And so it is with these verses from that 15th chapter of John's Gospel. I am the vine. The disciples to whom he spoke would be familiar with vines growing across the hillside of some parts of Palestine. It would ring a bell with them. Also, they would know and remember that the vine is a symbol of Israel, of the people of Israel, what we often call the Old Testament people of God, a symbol of them. One of the Psalms says, I brought a vine out of Egypt. The people of Israel brought out of Egypt. Jesus is the true vine. The disciples would have understood the reference and its implications, saying that the old people of Israel had failed to rise to the challenge that God had presented. He came from God as a true vine. The disciples would understand, probably there'd be a bit of an intake of breath at the implications, or some of them, of what Jesus was saying. So let's look at it in its three parts. I am the vine, you are the branches. St. Paul talked about Christians as the body of Christ, and with 
the different parts being like arms and legs and hands. It is a reminder that Christian faith is a corporate experience. We are called to be part of a Christian family, an active family. You cannot be a true Christian just by yourself. And then secondly, that's that bit about pruning the branches, chopping away the dead branches. Now, I am not really trusted to do serious gardening. I do so under instruction. I'm not bad at coarse labor. If I'm left to prune a rare event, I'm afraid it's chop and chance it. This is a reminder that there are parts of us that need changing. Bits of us that need cutting out. I suppose we're all a bit good at thinking about how other people should change. Some politicians and some journalists have developed the practice of character assassination almost to a fine art. You think about the downside of the email, the harm in the way that some emails are used. The use of social media, which is nothing short of evil, in the attacking of other people, thinking we know what other people should do in pruning themselves. But this instruction, this commandment as it really is, is to apply only to ourselves. Ask God to change us so that he may be better seen. There was a group of artists that used to meet together and when one had produced a picture, they would come round and criticize it, perhaps admire it. And they came one day because one of their friends had painted a new picture. And it was a picture of the Last Supper. And they made their various comments. And one said, I particularly like the way that you've got the light striking that lamp. And the artist stooped down, picked up his brush, dipped it into his palette, and painted out the lamp. His friend said, why did you do that? That's a bit I particularly admired. And he said, yes. So it takes away your attention from the one on whom the attention should be fixed. Quite General Manley Hopkins wrote of the Blessed Virgin Mary that she had this one thing to do, let all God's glory through. And how she did it. And that is the point of the pruning. And then thirdly, it is in order to bear fruit. That was a role of the branch. That's the point of the pruning, changing, not for its own sake, but to better represent Christ. Because it is through us that he is so often seen in the world. As St. Teresa of Avila used to say, he has no hands but our hands to do his work today. He has no feet but our feet to lead folk in his way. He has no voice but our voice to tell them how he died. He has no love but our love to draw them to his side. For it is by a life lived and regularly pruned by the word 
of God and the teaching of Christ. But only if we abide in Christ will the pruning be true. As the little verse in the letter of St. Jude says, hold yourselves in the love of God. A way perhaps of constant prayer. If we'd like a word for this Sunday, I think it might be the word wait. Wait or waiting. Because it is, in a sense, certainly in the scheme of the church's year, a Sunday of waiting. A kind of in-between Sunday. If you want colloquial, it's probably neither t'other nor which. It's not a great festival, but it's not quite an ordinary Sunday, and it's between a great festival, Ascension Day, last Thursday, and Pentecost, Whit Sunday, coming up next Sunday. In between. And the first disciples of Jesus, in a way, must have felt themselves in between kind of people. They were in between two roles, as we might see in a minute. Told to wait. Wait can be a positive activity. Now, we've been waiting, in a sense, for quite some months now as we've been in, in lockdown, a particular form of waiting that we would not have chosen, but which has been necessary to go through. That lockdown, which has been a time of waiting. I wonder what it's meant for us. I wonder if there have been any particular ways in which we've been able to use it. I wonder how we will come out of it when we do. And let's still hope and pray for the 21st of June, even though it's sounding a bit doubtful at the moment. Will we have changed when we come out of it? Will we have changed through this period of a kind of waiting as individuals? And as a church, if we have, that will mean that it has in some senses been a positive experience at waiting. There's an old evangelical hymn, and I associate it with the Salvation Army, you know, the great bass band and the big bass drum. Um, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. That's not for looking back, but for the strength for looking forward. Someone once said when asked about praying for the future, kneel on the promises of God and so able to face a future. Has our been a waiting, a taking stock, been something like that? That is how the disciples found it on that time between Ascension Day and Whit Sunday, Pentecost. And it was for them a time of taking stock expectantly. We know a family where the children quite regularly said at mealtime, what's for pudding? And they were told it's wasp pudding. Wait and see pudding. Wait and see pudding. That was waiting expectantly, hopefully. So it was with those first disciples. So pray God it is for us in our particular times 
of waiting. The disciples came into that period of waiting after the ascension, still as disciples about to be changed. As disciples, they were pupils. They learned, they heard, they were taught, they listened to the teachings of Jesus. They saw what he did and heard what he said. But they were changed at the end of this waiting into apostles. No longer disciples, except in the sense that we always all are. Turned into apostles, sent out everywhere to tell what they had heard and seen of the wisdom, the teaching, the patience, the judgment, and the love of God for all people. There was a transformation from disciples to apostles. I wonder in our waitings how we as individuals and as a church might find ourselves transformed and perhaps doing things in a new role or in a new way. And it all to God be glory. Amen. In Jerusalem, it can get pretty hot, at least from about the month of May through until the end of September or into October. Certainly hot during the day, but very often, not absolutely every day, but significantly, in the evening, a gentle breeze will get up, which tempers the heat, at least to some degree. And I like to think that that was part of what happened when Jesus had that conversation with Nicodemus. He came to him by night, it says, after sunset, when it had got dark. As we know from the Gospels, Jesus, when he was in Jerusalem, liked to go with his disciples to what we now call the Garden of Gethsemane, with the olive trees that are there, still there, some of them very ancient. And I imagine Jesus talking with Nicodemus as that breeze had got up, saying, listen to the wind moving the leaves of the olive trees, Nicodemus. Listen to the wind. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Listen to the wind. The wind blows where it wills, and you hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going to. The wind blows where it wills. Clever people might, for a few moments, divert the wind, but it goes back on its course. Again, the wind blows where it wills, where it chooses, so is everyone born of the Spirit. It's telling us this, that you cannot tame God. You cannot domesticate the Spirit of God. You cannot tie God down. In the old prayer book, just after the services of morning and evening prayer, there's set out a little piece of about 40 verses known by its Latin title, Quicunque Vult, which means whoever, whosoever will. 
It begins, whosoever will be saved, it is necessary before all things that he hold the Catholic faith. And this is the Catholic faith, that we worship Trinity in unity and unity in Trinity. Well, yes, that is what we celebrate on Trinity Sunday. And it goes on and on and on for 40 verses, defining God, tying him down. I don't think anybody's been saved by reading the Qui Cum Prevolt. I think quite a few have probably been scared by what it says. A reminder to us to be a bit more humble. Okay. I remember someone saying quite some years ago, I don't see why a generation that can cheerfully get its tongue around something like intercontinental ballistic missile should have its theology in noddy language. Well, with that, I would agree. But a reminder, and for me, that qui revolt, which I've been forced to say on a number of occasions, I do not believe points to what is fundamental, and that is you cannot domesticate the wind blows where it wills. And you hear the sound of it. You can't see the wind. You know the wind is there by its effects, by what it does. You hear its sound. You hear the trees blowing. If you're walking with the wind at your back, it's wonderful. If you're on your bike pedaling against it, it's not quite so good. You hear the sound of it. You know its effect. The work of the Spirit of God in human lives. We've all seen it, even if we've not at the moment recognized it as such. The kindness of a neighbor. The whole work of healing in its organized way, over the centuries, developed through people who understood they were working according to the leading of the Spirit of God. The whole world of education and new thought, or the love in a family. You know the Spirit of God is there by its effect. The wind blows where it wills, and you hear the sound of it. But you can't tell where it's coming from. Who knows from where God will speak? He may step out of the pages of a newspaper, and one item that convicts a person about what God is doing in the world, or where we need to look for God in the world. It may come through another person. Quite often God speaks through someone whom we'd rather wish God didn't speak. Not our best friends, might we say. And yet, the Spirit of God is working there. The wind blows where it will and you hear the sound of it. But you don't know where it's come from and you don't know where it's going. Who knows where we might be led by the Spirit of God? Who knows where, as we come out of this coronavirus, we might be led by what we've learned in and through it, what we might learn as a church what we thought was important and we found is not quite so important. Who knows where the Spirit of God might lead? Our God is a God of surprises. Someone said one of the oldest things we know about God is that God is always doing new things. You never know. Where is God? 
and where he's seeking to lead us. I was reminded of some of my confirmation candidates responding to the work of God, the Holy Spirit. Sometimes a bishop will say when he's confirmed a person, particularly if we're anointing with oil on the forehead, receive the gift of the seal of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that has worked in people's lives in all sorts of ways. And I think of just a few whom it's been my privilege to share the Holy Spirit with in their confirmation. I remember going to Paphos in Cyprus to confirm six people. One, I had to go down to his home on the shoreline he was 94. He'd been an English surgeon. His wife had been a committed Christian for many years. And he kept saying to her, you'll grow out of it, you'll grow out of it. He grew into it. That was the leading of the Spirit, working in no small measure through, through his wife. He thought that He's going to get the record that he'd be the oldest person that I'd ever confirmed. I had to disappoint him. The oldest one was a woman of 95. She had moved about half a mile from the church in which she was baptized, which was no longer standing, and had lived no further than that, half a mile away from it, all her life. 95, she came to confirmation, and one sensed the spirit working in her life. And then I went up to the church in Paphos to confirm five others. Only one was younger than me, and I guess I was about 67 then. One of them was a Jew, 77 years old. And I said to him after the service, You've had an interesting journey, Isaac. And he said, yes, Bishop. And I've come home at last. The working of the Spirit of God. I saw it in, at 160 people I confirmed at one go in Ethiopia. Some of whom had walked for three days and nights to be at that service slipping quietly over the border between one country and another. The Spirit was there. The Spirit in their lives. The wind blows where it wills, and you hear the sound of it, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for the beginning. In 1973, a German-born British economist, E.F. Schumacher, wrote a book called Small is Beautiful. It was a phrase which for some years caught the imagination Small is beautiful. It became almost a mantra. Almost two and a half thousand years before, the prophet Zechariah had said, do not despise the day of small things. That in one way points to the message that Jesus was making in the gospel we've just heard. Things that are small, but of great significance. And taking particularly the mustard seed. Jesus, as always, in his teaching, uses things with which his hearers were familiar. They would have known the mustard seed 
growing there, sometimes a certain variety, a bit different from our charlock, which doesn't grow quite so high, growing so that it can shelter the birds. But the mustard seed, which starts from a tiny, tiny seed. I suppose for us, the mustard does not speak in the same way. Perhaps for us, it's a mighty oak which comes from the tiny acorn. Small, but within it, the principle and the possibility of growth. And Jesus used that to describe the kingdom of God. Now when we think of the word kingdom, we probably think in spatial terms. The kingdom as an area, geographical. As it is used by Jesus and as it is used in the Gospels and in Christian teaching, it stands not for a spatial area, but for the reign or the rule of God. That is a kingdom. The kingship of God recognized and exercised in the world. The rule of God. And now it is only partial. In places, the acceptance of the rule of God may be faltering and tiny. But within it, there is the potential to grow. And here now, we see examples of that. Wherever there is love, as we prayed God for in the collet, wherever there is true love, wherever there is justice, wherever there is integrity, wherever there is truth, there God is, and there is, however tiny, a breaking in of the kingdom. The kingdom of God in all its fullness we shall only know in heaven at the end of time. But now we glimpse some of it, and by the privilege God gives us, we can be part of it. Not all of the kingdom of God, but we see some of it. It's what theologians call realized eschatology. Well, don't let that worry you. Glimpsing now what is in its fullness to come. And so it tells us not to despise the day of small things as Zachariah said. I think of this when involved in what some people slightly sneeringly call indiscriminate baptism. We have a couple you've never met or never seen before and you don't think they darken the doors of the church and they ask for their baby to be baptized. Now, within the Church of England, anybody living within a parish has the right to be baptized in their parish church. But even were that not so, I believe that it's right to take that request and work with it and baptize that baby. There must be something there to make them ask for that action. And, please God, so far as one is able, work with it. You never know what a little word may do. It came to my mind as I was thinking what I was going to say this morning, I saw in my mind's eye a senior bank manager of an international bank 
who used to come to church each Sunday evening. When I was leaving the parish, he wrote to me to wish me well. And he said, you may have wondered about me, because he never hung around. He came quietly into church, and he was off almost after the echo of the last Amen had faded. But he said, I came to so-and-so's funeral, which you took, and you said something which made me think there might be something in that. And I've come to church each week ever since. And my faith has been made to grow. That's not about me. It's a way God, the Holy Spirit, can work. Little in the hands of God become much. We see it in some of the miracles, particularly the feeding of the 5,000. Put it into God's hands. You don't know how it will grow, how it will develop. Another little phrase. Never accept the obvious as the limit of the possible. And then, how is the kingdom of God shown in the church? The Roman Catholic Church, until a few years ago, used to say, extra ecclesia non est salus. Outside the church there is no salvation. They won't say that now. A few backwoodsmen might, but I mean they, they, they don't. Um, it, it's left to the sort of rather more ultra-strict Protestants to do that sort of thing now, but they de- downplay the church a bit of it. The church and the kingdom of God are not coterminous. They are not the same. The kingdom of God is bigger than anything, even the church, that can can confine it. As Bishop David Jenkins used to say, even the church can't keep a good God down. (laughs) The kingdom of God is greater. But the church, and particularly we in it, who make up the church, are called to be the agents of that kingdom and to enable that growth of which the Lord spoke. To him be glory. Amen. In April, I was given the gift of a new attachment to my telescope. And it sat on a table used for nothing until yesterday. Do not accept the grace of God in vain. It said at the beginning of that first reading. It was almost as if I had accepted my gift in vain. It sat for two months unused. It's rather like, I don't know if you've done it, but I certainly had. My eye was taken by a book in the bookshop or after a review, and I bought it. And three months later, I found it and realized I had not even turned over the first page. Do not accept it in vain. Do not accept the grace of God in vain. We openly, publicly received the grace of God at baptism. And there we were given that status as Christians. But unless it is seen in character, it will have been accepted in vain. That grace, that working of God for good in a person's life. Occasionally I say at baptism, it's getting more and more difficult to sort of know 
people to know what you're talking about because checkbooks are going out, aren't they? You know, it's all bank transfer. You don't use checks. I only use mine, I think, now to pay the paper bill. But take a checkbook. I sometimes say at baptism, it's like giving a check. The child or the person's name is on that check. It's dated with the date of the baptism. And God has signed it. But how much that check is filled in for is filled up by that person during life. That is part of the responsibility of baptism. Do not receive the grace of God in vain. Receiving God it should be seen in the character. Paul explained the nature of that character in three ways. Firstly, he said, Look at us. That's a pretty bold thing to say. Dare we say it? Look at us and see something of the character of those who have accepted and worked with the grace of God. And he gave three characteristics. First was endurance. It's listed there in different words. Endurance, perseverance, that can commend itself to other people. We got a bit of admiration still for someone who completes a marathon or climbs Everest or rows single-handedly across the Atlantic or even climbs the three peaks. Endurance, staying with it, stickability, as it's sometimes called. The Christian does not easily give up. And then secondly, receiving the grace means showing what often in this world is an unusual character. Paul listen in his way. Patience, kindness, love for other people. We might say going the second mile. The character the Christian shows the grace of God received. And then thirdly, the Christian is a person of paradox. Person in whom strength is found in weakness, and weakness becomes strength. How did Paul put it? We are treated as impostors, and yet are true, as unknown, and yet are well known, as dying, and see we are alive as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. The paradox of the Christian life filled by the grace of God. And supremely, that strength in weakness seen on the cross in the crucifixion of Jesus. Weakness which became known as power. Do not accept the grace of God in vain. Or as the New English Bible puts it, do not let it go for nothing. Amen. There are quite a few expressions in Christian faith which sound contradictory. 
because the truth of God is so big that our human minds can't contain it, and we can only express it in what we might call a paradox. A paradox which is a seeming contradiction, where two apparently totally opposed things are held together. And that is the only way that we humans can begin to contain some of the truth that is larger than our own minds. We find that, particularly in Christian teaching and in the life and death of Jesus. Do you remember, did you pick up those words at the end of that first reading that Marcia read to us? That Paul said, I can only quote in the old version, but you'll get it. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. There's the opposition, strength and weakness. And so it is. The paradox of Christian truth. The paradox of Christian life. Jesus in weakness dies on the cross. The strength of the cross which has inspired people through the ages and in which they in their weakness have found strength. My grace is sufficient for you for my strength is made perfect in weakness. The grace of God, the help of God, making us strong in our weakness, giving us all that we need, not all that we would like necessarily, but all that we need. The grace of God, you made perfect in weakness. We are here as a little congregation. We come, three people, to be baptized. We may seem small. We may in human terms seem weak. And yet, we come as part of the great worldwide church of God, which stretches back through centuries of time. How did that church begin? With one man who was more than who died in seeming weakness in human terms on a cross, who by the strengthening power of God rose again from the dead and drew together a few men and a few women. And from that little group, there has grown a worldwide Christian church claiming belief in that one God whose Son was crucified in weakness. Spread around the world, the larger part of it now in what we sometimes call the global south. Europe's got to catch up again. And out of that weakness, perhaps, a new strength will come. In your baptism, God is saying to you, you may come just as individuals, feeling not always up to it. Be assured, my strength, my help, my grace will find its place and be made perfect in your weakness. That's why this is such a happy occasion, because the grace of God is here, and it will be poured out as it has been down the centuries, outwardly in the symbol of water and a welcome of a congregation, inwardly in the strengthening grace of God.
I begin with a question for us to ponder together. Is anger a good thing or a bad thing? Maybe if we just change the word anger for the word fire. Is fire a good thing or a bad thing? Well, when it keeps you warm, when it burns up a load of rubbish, it's a good thing. If it's in the wrong place, if it gets out of hand, it becomes a bad thing. Is it not so with anger? It's not a straight good or bad. It can be good. It can be bad. I wonder if there are things which make you angry. I wouldn't be surprised. I get at least one nod. Each week on a Friday, the Church Times publishes on its back page an interview um, with someone who may be Christian, not always a Christian, may be sort of nominally a Christian, but someone who is in public life or doing good things to help many people. And quite often, towards the end of the interview, the interviewer asks, what makes you angry? I wonder what our answer would be for that. I think mine, and I was interviewed for that page once, I can't remember what I said, um, but if I were asked that question then, I would probably have said what I would say now. What makes me most angry, I think, is cruelty to little children and the abuse of little children, which is such a breaking of trust. We each have our own thing which might make us angry. In that Gospel which I read a moment ago, Jesus said, I say to you, Whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Anger without a cause. The Gospel sets out three reasons where anger is wrong where anger is bad. And that first one is anger without a cause or without a just cause. We may think as an example from the Gospels of that perhaps best known parable of Jesus, the parable of the prodigal son. And at the end of the story, when the feast has been made to rejoice that the prodigal son has returned, the elder brother stands outside and will not go in. Because his pride has been hurt. He's resentful. That points to a wrong kind of anger. Anger which comes from pride or comes from resentment. And then the Gospel talks about what is really worship. You can't come to true worship. You can't worship properly in church if all inside you is boiling up anger. You know, so if you're cross with the vicar, or you're mad with the church warden, and that's going to be your main thought all through the service. Well, perhaps it's better to give it a miss that week. Anger of that kind, which needs reconciliation, needs forgiveness. And we know that unless we come forgiving, 
we cannot be forgiven. And so, anger. Anger that is wrong. Anger that takes us away from God. And the third one is the anger that we may harbor within us. And that just makes life less than life should be. The anger that we cling on to. Again, it's a reminder that if we can't forgive, we can't be forgiven. And so there is that need for healing. Healing within us. Healing within that will affect all that comes out. And we're better to come for healing, but to the healer whom we receive in holy communion. Amen. I suppose it's because we're coming towards the end of a year and we're standing on the threshold of a new one that that set me thinking about time. Sometimes time seems to pass so very quickly, too quickly almost, particularly when we're enjoying something. Or well, then it can seem to drag Drag perhaps when we're, we're keenly looking forward to some event or meeting someone and it seems to be just taking ages to get to that point. Time. Time very precious. Time which in some ways is quite puzzling. The two words in Greek for time, Greek you remember as the original writings mostly, of the New Testament. One, chronos, is about time generally, the time that stretches on and on and on, linear time, um, if you like. And then there is kairos. Kairos, the time of the particular moment, the time of opportunity the appropriate time. Probably remember those words quite often quoted from Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament. For everything its season and for every activity under heaven its time. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to pull down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time for mourning and a time for dancing. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear. A time to mend. A time for silence and a time for speech. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. My headmaster had a favourite prayer which we heard quite regularly in school assembly. Save us from the misuse of time 
which cannot come back. I suppose it's a bit like Robert Herrick's poem, Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. God, of course, is outside time. God inhabits eternity. But God acts in time, and he's never not acted in time. The Old Testament is very much a portrayal of the God of action. And at Christmas, as we've just been celebrating, we have God entering human history and time in a decisive and new way. The eternal word was made flesh and dwelt among us. There can be a specific act, as this was, at a particular point in time. And that birth of God coming in this new way into his creation was significant for all time. And so we stand on the threshold of a new year. What will it bring? We hope and pray that it will bring the defeat of the COVID virus. Many other things perhaps we hope for. How shall we be shaped by time that is to come? And how shall we shape time? Come what may, if we enter this new year with Christ and walk through it with him, it will be a new year and we shall be a new people. In a way, each day and each year are kind of miniatures of the whole of life and point us to our prayers. At the beginning of the day, we look forward. We look to what there is to do, to whom we shall meet, with joy and praise and with prayer for guidance and strength. At the end of the day, we come with thanksgiving for all that has been good in it, with sorrow for what has been bad. To pray for a quiet night and a perfect end at the close of life. And so there is a rhythm of time that sets a pattern for the rhythm of our prayers. I'd like to close with a slightly extended part of a meditative prayer by Michel Coist. You who are beyond time, Lord, you smile to see us fighting it. And you know what you are doing. You make no mistakes in your distribution of time to men. You give each one time to do what you want him to do. But we must not lose time, waste time, kill time. For time is a gift that you give us, but a perishable gift, a gift that does not keep. Lord, I have time, I have plenty of time, all the time that you give me, the years of my life, the days of my years, the hours of my days, they are all mine. Mine to fill quietly, calmly, but to fill completely up to the brim, to offer them to you, that of their insipid water you may make a rich wine, such as you made once in Cana of Galilee. I am not asking you tonight, Lord, 
or now for time to do this and then that, but your grace to do conscientiously in the time that you give me what you want me to do. Amen. just heard a version of John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Hymn, and so that gives us a clue to some of the things we may be thinking about in the next few minutes. But first, before we come to that, just a prayer. Spirit of God, set at rest the crowded hurrying, anxious thoughts within our minds and hearts. Let the peace and quiet of your presence take possession of us. Help us to rest, to relax, to become open and receptive to you. You know our inmost spirits, the hidden unconscious life within us, the forgotten memories of hurts and fears, the frustrated desires, the unresolved tensions and dilemmas. Cleanse and sweeten the springs of our being, that freedom, life and love may flow into both our conscious and hidden life. Lord, we lie open before you, waiting for your peace, your healing, your word. Robert Louis Stevenson said, to travel hopefully is a better thing than to arrive. I think the Christian pilgrim would disagree. For the goal at which hopes arrive is God in all his fullness, heaven. You may think of the Celtic, Peregrini, as they were called, setting out in little frail boats, going wherever the winds of the Spirit might take them. And their goal? To find the place of their resurrection. Those were their words. To find the place of their resurrection. But traveling is exciting and necessary, necessary to get there, to where we're going. If we don't move, we get nowhere, we get stuck. Indeed, we travel hopefully, travel in faith, 
and faith and hope are close companions. Pilgrimage is about moving. Some years ago, I saw in a person's study these words. When a great ship is moored in the harbor, it is safe and there is no doubt. But that is not what great ships are built for. Who was the first recorded pilgrim, I wonder? In the Bible, it was probably Abraham. Abraham who was called to leave his country, his relatives, and set out for another country. Promised he would become a great nation, God's new people, who will be a blessing for all nations and possess a new land. In Abraham's response to God's call, we see the kind of trust God asks of each of us. In that way, he is the father of us all. How can we be true descendants in the faith? Put another way, how can we be true pilgrims? Abraham responded to God's call. Actions demonstrate faith. It's not all in the mind. Say yes and then think of the consequences. Sometimes there's sacrifice at the heart of it. Abraham left family, home, title, security. He's even tested by the sacrifice of his son. He's been called the man with empty hands whom God can use. And then be a Christian pilgrim. Trust God for the unknown future. Who knows what the future will bring? Who knows quite how we're going to get out of the restrictions and lockdowns of this COVID pandemic? Who knows where our traveling as pilgrims will take us mentally, if not geographically and spatially? Abraham was a model of faith because of obedience. The letter to the Hebrews records that Abraham set out not knowing where he was going. Action for Christ brings growth in the knowledge of Christ. Do you remember that little verse at the end of the story of the cleansing by Jesus of the lepers. And it said, as they were going, they were cleansed. As they believed it and acted on it, so they found that it was true and real. There's an old Latin phrase about faith, solvitur ambulando, which literally means found in walking, found by walking. It's in doing it that you know it's true. The pilgrimage of a Christian is not about knowing all the details. Faith involves struggles and questions. I have a little book on my shelves, I've referred to it once in a sermon here, called Joyful Uncertainty. That catches something. Joyful Uncertainty. The promise that Christ will walk with us through all the uncertainties and troubles of the world. Confident in the faithfulness of God text that was used at one of my ordinations was, faithful is he who calls you, 
who also will do it. And so, for pilgrims it may still mean, as all true faith means, this side of heaven, living with questions. That little book of which I wrote spoke, Joyful Uncertainty by Bishop Roy Williamson. He said in it he'd like to get a group together called Agnostics Anonymous. Something about Christian pilgrimage in, in that title. And then in the pilgrimage there is perseverance. Holding fast to God in disappointment. When famine came, Abraham persevered. When there were family troubles and physical danger. William Wilberforce, a great campaigner against slavery, after failure, had to wait 34 more years. But he persisted. That perseverance, that persistence is at the heart of the faith of the Christian pilgrim. Trust when it all seems impossible that little arrow prayer before doing something. Lord, I can't, you can. Or that phrase, never accept the obvious as the limit of the possible. Abraham was called the friend of God, the man who walked very close with God. Hebrews says, by faith Abraham when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. We think of pilgrims being people on the move with a sense of purpose. But be careful of having too clear a map. I sometimes Occasionally only now, go up to London and usually stay at the Royal Foundation of St. Catherine in Limehouse and set in the floor of the chapel there are words of St. Augustine. We do not come to God by navigation, but by love. There is a danger that all can appear a bit too structured. Where there's a danger of pilgrimage and faith becoming just a technique. Sometimes we may need to just drift along, not consciously thinking holy thoughts, like on a good walk by yourself, just enjoying all that's around you without consciously thinking about it. Rather like, you know, Hilaire Belloc and his little um, thing about the water beetle. The water beetle here does teach a lesson far beyond our reach. He flabbergasts the human race by gliding on the water's face with too temerity and grace. But if he ever stopped to think of how he did it, he would sink. Little verse in the epistle of Jude. Hold yourself in the love of God. And another phrase, accept that you are accepted. I want to close these few thoughts on journeying in faith and Christian pilgrimage with some words from the theologian Mona Hooker was meditating on the end of St. Mark's Gospel, which many people have found puzzling because it seems to be cut short. And it ends saying the disciples on the resurrection morning and they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. She says this, Go and you will see him says the messenger to the disciples, not you will see him and then you must go. And this 
is the message of Mark to his readers. Is it not, after all, a good place to end the gospel? For this is the real beginning of discipleship, and it is the beginning for Mark's own readers, who do not see Jesus in any physical way. The promise is to them, as well as to the eleven frightened disciples, follow Jesus. That is the only way in which you will find him. And so a prayer. Christ our guide, stay with us in our pilgrimage. When we falter, encourage us. When we stumble, steady us. And when we have fallen, pick us up. Help us to become step by step more truly ourselves and remind us that you have traveled before us. In your name we pray. I don't know about you, but one of the things that I miss because of the restrictions that we're under at the present time is being able to sing and being able to sing the hymns. I've always enjoyed singing hymns right from the time that I was a choir boy. Of course, I had favorites and some which we didn't understand and some which were mildly amusing. For some people, not being able to sing hymns is probably a relief, but I suspect that they are a minority. For most of us, there feels to be just something missing. Hymns I find very special. They stay in the mind, and they can sometimes lead to some rather surprising conversations. I remember I used to, when I was a curate, I used to take communion to an elderly man. And on one occasion he said to me, when he was younger, he was in church and he fell asleep during the sermon. And he woke up to hear the vicar say, we sing the hymn, Christians seek not yet repose. But the serious side to it too. And hymns, a verse of a hymn, can stay in the mind for years. And suddenly when we're up against it, perhaps, it comes back again. And it helps us on. It's a kind of prayer. I find hymns useful for prayers. I use verses of hymns and whole hymns in my prayers, I sometimes even sing them to myself and I trust to God. I used to find going round from one service to another on a Sunday morning it was a way of concentrating my mind as I thought of a hymn or sang a hymn in between churches. Hymns are not poetry, and they're not for teaching. Though I remember saying on one or two occasions that I'm sure it was only a knowledge of the hymns in the English hymnal that got me through my doctrine exams in college. Um, slight exaggeration, I hope, but um, probably a grain of truth in it too. Not poetry, not teaching, though they can be both. But they're also many of them and the best of them and the ancient ones of them are biblical. They have biblical references. Sometimes they have almost a direct quotation from the Bible. Now we stand on the threshold 
of Holy Week. And I'd like to look at a hymn which was originally written for communion services, but fits well especially with the Passion, the Crucifixion of Christ. If we were able to sing, I'm sure it would be sung in many places on Good Friday. It's a hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. You can look at the cross as a ghastly tragedy, and yet seen through the eyes of faith, we see deep truths, truths of what is true about us, and truths of what is always true of God in Christ. We see our personal need, and we see the amazing love of Christ. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. When I survey the something almost detached about the word survey, um, a, a sort of almost a sort of cold and calculating feeling about it. That's not how Isaac Watts, a hymn writer, used it. It was used more in terms of contemplation, pondering the depth of the love seen on the cross. My richest gain I count but loss. That was a very clear reference to some words of St. Paul in his letter to the Philippians, which in some ways inspired this hymn, in which Paul says, Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as refuse in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own based on law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. My richest gain I count but loss, and therefore I pour contempt on all my pride. It's been said that there are three particularly insidious forms of pride, which have been called pride of faith, pride of race, and pride of grace. And it's that last one which is the worst. For pride of grace is spiritual pride. Paul said in another place, Forbid it, Lord, as the hymn says, that I should boast. It's those words of St. Paul that inspired the hymn. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the saving act of God, unbroken outpouring of love. It's another hymn, puts it, love to the uttermost, love to the uttermost, love to the uttermost, his love for me, from heaven's highest glory to earth's deepest shame, that is the love of my Saviour for me. All other things are of secondary importance. I sacrifice them to his blood. 
then see from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Sorrow and love flow mingled down. Perhaps Isaac Watts, the writer, had in mind those words from the Passion of St. John, where the soldier pierced the side of Jesus with his spear, and out there came blood mingled with water. Sorrow and love. Sorrow for the sin, love for the sinner. A reminder that must always be the response, the hate of sin, but with that the love of the sinner. Then with the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. If we could give everything, if we possess the whole world and could give it, it would be an inadequate return for all that Christ has done. God in Christ poured out love, amazing love, unbroken and unbreaking. What else but self-surrender dare we offer? My soul, my life, my all, our totality. My soul, that's what I am. My life, what I do, my daily activity. My all, what I have. My gifts my talents, my possessions, my wealth. Total love calls for total surrender. And so a passion prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Most High God, you emptied yourself and gave your whole life to us, even unto death, the death of the cross. Grant us to receive so immeasurable a gift penitently, gladly, and thankfully, and to hold back nothing of ourselves from others and from you, who live and reign in the glory of the eternal Trinity, God forever and ever. Amen.